Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. I can't believe how quickly time is flying and that we're actually nearing the end of Regenerations, the exhibit and the programming series. As Kelly mentioned, if you haven't managed to see the exhibit yet, there's still a little bit more time to check it out. We'll be running until October 24th. And then our programming series, which we have a couple more programming programs coming up, that will be available on our website um, and continue on on the website, bishopmuseum.org slash regenerations. So today we have an incredible panel of experts convened to talk about digital curation of cultural heritage and the very unique challenges as well as opportunities that digitizing museum collections affords. I'd like to introduce our moderator, for this evening, uh, Noel M. K. Y. Kahanu. Noel is Kanaka Oiva, Oivi, Native Hawaiian. She's a 15-year veteran of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii, where she developed scores of exhibitions and programs. She worked on the renovation of Hawaiian Hall, Pacific Hall, and the landmark exhibition A Kuana Kapaya. More recently, she's been involved in international repatriations. She has a law degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she currently serves as an Associate Assistant Specialist in Public Humanities and Native Hawaiian Programs within the American Studies Department. Her current research and practice explores the liberating and generative opportunities when museums seed, that's S-E-E-D, authority, rather than seed, C-E-D-E, -E, authority. A lot to think about there. And we've been really grateful to Noelle for all of her input and help as Regenerations came together, as well as in thinking through how we should curate this programming series. So I'm very happy to hand it off to her and let her get us started. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Valina Maine. Um, it is such an honor to be here tonight and to be in conversation around an area of emerging importance, the digital curation of cultural heritage. Mahalo to Bishop Museum, to Jillian and Leah uh, for conceiving of this topic as part of a broader program around its exhibition, Regeneration, Challenging Scientific Racism in Hawaii. While we won't necessarily be focusing on the exhibition. It is relevant to the conversation that over 900 photographs taken by Lewis R. Sullivan in 1920 and 21 do exist on the Office of Hawaiian Affairs Public Hilo database. Bishop Museum will also be creating an online version of the Regeneration exhibition which brings to mind the idea that what we see in physical form within a defined space can endure in other digital forms beyond the exhibition's closing date. But again, this is never truly a substitute. And like the previous speakers have said um, before, I would really urge those of you who have not yet gone to see the exhibition in person before its closing on October 24th. Um, perhaps as an entry point into this conversation on digital curation, we can think about what the term means. Curation has its roots in the word curatus and curé, and encompasses the idea of caring for the physical and spiritual well being of a collection, of being a good steward and guardian. In an indigenous context, there are many examples where museums and communities have worked together to keep these collections warm, whether it be through taking ancestral items out into the sunlight or having them sung or spoken to or housing them in ways that reflect the various levels of mana. Sometimes it's about working with communities to appropriately rename ancestral items and annotating records to provide greater cultural understanding. And sometimes the most ethical and appropriate thing to do is for the re physical return of these mea vai vai to their, to their home communities in the form of repatriation. But what happens when these mea the actual collection or exhibition is digital. How does this change the standard of care? Beyond issues of metadata and technical preservation, 
what becomes of these images that can appear across the globe in a split second. For indigenous communities whose images and likenesses have been exploited, commodified, and appropriated for centuries, such issues are particularly complex. I'm just extremely grateful that we have with us a stellar panel who will help us navigate these waters, whose combined experiences span the gamut from collections care to exhibitions and from artists to curators. With us tonight is Joy Lehua Nani Inomoto, a Kanaka Maoli educator, visual artist, and activist who lives in Oahu, Hawaii. She lectures in Pacific Island Studies and Library Information Science at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she has taught on archives and ethical handling of indigenous materials and the ethics of photography. She is a co-author of Saltwater Archives, Native Knowledge in a Time of Rising Tides. And we will send further information about how to access um, some of these resources later on. With us also is Brandy McDonald, a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation with Choctaw ancestry. She is currently Senior Director of Decolonizing Initiatives at the Museum of Us and a PhD fellow at UC San Diego. Her work and publications focus on transformative and systemic change within museums that is driven by an anti-colonial and decolonial theory in practice in order to redress colonial harm that occurs domestically and internationally. Kolokesa Uafa Mahina Tuai is here representing both herself and Tolu Ma'anave Barbara Makuati Afitu, who is unable to be with us tonight. Kolokesa of Tongan heritage, together with Tolu Ma'anave, who is of Samoan heritage, are co-founders of Lagi Mama Academy and Consultancy, a cultural organization based in Aotearoa, New Zealand. With backgrounds in stakeholder management, community engagement, art history, social anthropology, and museums and heritage studies, they mediate at the intersection, intersection of indigenous communities and institutional settings to create a harmonious time space by embedding different ways of knowing, seeing, and doing. Tonight, we will be posing three rounds of questions to our panelists, and this will be followed by an opportunity to dialogue, and then we will open for questions from the audience. So again, <laughs> it may go without saying, but I'm so very honored to be here in the presence of these three incredible Indigenous women who have um, advocated in really significant and important ways for their communities. And um, I'm looking forward to this uh, important conversation around uh, did the digital curation of cultural heritage. So, Belina, my name, welcome everyone. <laughs> so the first question, uh, tell us about your work and how you engage with issues regarding digital collections. And perhaps we can go in order of the bios that I read. <laughs> that means Joy is up first. I will get you later for that. Aloha mai kako. How do I even begin how I started in the digital collection? I, I can't start with the digital without start first thinking about the physical collections. I started um, my relationship to, to basically archival objects in the preservation department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Hamilton Library. And really it begins before that. I was working as a student worker in the Sinclair Library, which people may not know, may or may not know, is a, basically an open air library that had some of its rarest journals uh, that had been moved there temporarily for 10 years um, in an open air library where materials were literally being like deteriorating in front of my eyes. Uh, 
that had bird nests in them and other kinds of life. And I was like, we need to do something about this. So I, I was actually asked by the then head of preservation, can you look into some natural history books? And I basically just went all in. Uh, I got really obsessed with the care of materials uh, in that sense, it was physical materials and rare book collections. And I was doing all of this sort of study of provenance and all this, just because I was that kind of nerd. Um, and the, um, the head of the department came over and was like, I don't know, I've never met a student. Uh, and I was, you know, I wasn't a young student that that is like this obsessed with rare books. And I was like, well, I'm kind of like this kind of nerd. And she was like, you need to come and work with me over here because we have all these. Other and I got just really obsessed with with archives and rare book collections. She was like, you have to go to a library school. Um, and this was not my original path. I had I had just gotten a BFA in photography. I was working on a BFA in photography as a second degree. Um, I was really, um, you know, I was really, you know, I'm a community organizer. I was obsessed with um, other things at the time. And I really was just like wanting to be an artist, but the something about the archives, the Imperial archive, I should say, was really, uh, had gripped me because I was like, we need to be in control of our own information. We need to be in control of our own images. Uh, and we need to be able to recognize what's important for us. Um, and I became really obsessed with sort of the ethics of photography in particular and, and, of, and of indigenous uh, folks, Aboriginal folks, uh, you know, Kanaka Maoli, like how is our image used? What is the agency that we have with those images? And then when you take it to the, and that's just the physical side, that's just when you look at the material culture of, of photography, the negatives, the, right, the, the, the original resource, those kinds of resources, how they were used, when they were used. And then I, then we started thinking about how do you digitize these, right? We wanna make this, right? Librarians are all about accessibility, right? We're, we're, archivists are actually not so much about accessibility. So that's where people get confused. Librarians are all about access. Archivists are just now getting hip to the jive around um, access. Um, archivists tend to be seen as gatekeepers and not so much like, let's give it to everybody, right? Um, it's, it's a totally different world. And I think people need to remember that archivists and librarians are different. It's a different game. Um, but coming to the archive, it was becoming this thing where we put things online, but what surrounds that material? Who has access to that? Uh, when we think about climate change and as things, you know, things become more uh, in danger, you have these really benevolent libraries like, like the University of Hawaii or the University of Australia or um, the British Library or things like that, wanting to come in and save you are, you know, these island collections, which really means uh, we want to be able to get access to collections maybe that we would have never had access to so that we can make it available to everybody uh, other, right? And so it's a, it's a slippery slope. Right, and so when we think about uh, photography in particular, yes, we want to be able to have access for our people because of the interruption, because of the violence of colonialism, because of the violence of occupation that has taken us away from those images that have taken us away from those, from our artifacts. At the same time, how do we have that in a way that's uh, ethical, responsible to and, and honoring indigenous people in ways that um, that really is appropriate. And I think that sometimes people confuse a photograph as just an object. We know that photographs are filled with mana, right? I have my ancestors behind me. I actually literally sat here with my ancestors behind me in photograph because I know their mana is there in that. Uh, and so uh, we, when I think of, you know, when I teach on these things and I, and I teach, uh, library students, um, also art students about the ethics of photography or the ethics of how do you create policies around ethic, you know, I get to, I try to get to the people before they're in the museum, right, <laughs> because it's kind of late. Um, how do you think about the policies that you create around the ethical handling of Indigenous materials? 
throughout the Pacific, and for us in particular, the Pacific, we have particular protocols, relationships. Uh, each, each island has different relationships to image, to object, uh, you know, and we need to be able to honor all of those individual things, not just this blanket, everybody gets access. But then when you also put out material without any proper metadata, then we can then assert our own desires, our own uh, ideas, in, you know, uh, which has been going on for centuries by other people already. So how do we help ourselves as indigenous, as indigenous or native folks, or occupied folks, however you want to say it, um, to reclaim those images uh, in really, uh, but all, and protect those images for us while balancing that relationship to research. Uh, I think that, uh, can I kick it off to somebody else now? <laughs> yes, thank mahalo. Um, thank you for that. And so Brandy, would you like to go next? Halito um, chokma. So I, um, so much respect for what Joy has said. And even just I, a lot of it resonates with um, the work that I do at the Museum of Us and also in the field. And so even just thinking about um, honoring and recognizing access. And so how I approach um, and the work that um, I'm engaged with is looking at um, that, that question of access. Like, what does that look like in the colonial legacy of access? Who has always had access to these cultural resources and heritage items? Um, and it hasn't been indigenous people, right? The, they're the gatekeepers have always closed out indigenous folks and the people, the descendants and the folks that the, the ancestors and that belong to the items that were stolen and taken um, and all of the digital aspects that we're talking about. And so the work that we are doing at the Museum of Us and the way we're seeing access is really recognizing that colonial legacy and that perpetration of colonial harm. And what does it look like to not do that anymore, <laughs> at least to the best of our abilities, right? And so recognizing what access looks like and what indigenous people have asked us about access. And so it's switching that uh, paradigm of indigenous access um, and writing access policies with indigenous communities around the cultural resources that they're, their communities that it's from, that they're related to. Um, we don't have access policies for all of the cultural resources in every single community yet, maybe one day, um, but we have been working with our home community to create an access policy, the Kumeyaay community. Um, who's the ancestral unceded homeland from where I'm at in San Diego at the moment and where the museum resides. And what the community has asked is that they, them and their descendants have complete access to the cultural resources where the, uh, from their community. But researchers and non-Kumeyaay peoples and non-Kumeyaay descendant peoples um, need to connect with the Kumeyaay Heritage Preservation Council and ask for access. Um, so that they are the ones that determine, not the museum. So when people approach us, they, we reflect to the access policy, the community has asked us to do this, this is when you need to go. And then they need to come with us with the proof that the community has given them access. And so that is a space that um, we really wanna hold. We also have a blanketed access policy is what does it look like to connect with the community to make sure versus just exerting yourself and consistently using this feeling of white supremacy, this sense of urgency that you have to have access tomorrow because you're here on a research project instead of really engaging in the community and, and having a conversation um, that the process isn't about you if you're doing research on Maya community members you should be talking about Maya community members and talking to them um, we also look at what does that look like with working with community members and when we talk about digital curation um, is connecting the photographs right joy mentioned um, those are your ancestors and so communities have asked us to take photos of their ancestors and place them next to the physical object until they can go home so that they're still connected to their relatives. Um, so it, really recognizing that connection um, and the, the relation between the two. And then we really also recognize like, what does it look like to create digital spaces? Um, what does it mean to have a platform on Google Arts and Culture where it's not about the object? It's not about a vessel and talking about the metadata of the vessel. It's about consent. And if we're going to be talking about community members, and their items, then we need consent from the community in order to put those, because that's our commitment to the community is that it's they have the autonomy and we're recognizing their rights to self-determination because we haven't asked them for consent for over a hundred years. And so what does it mean to have these digital spaces and talk to interns and to hold like us accountable for the harm that we can per like, perpetrate and may unintentionally perpetrate as well. I'll stop there and maybe pass the mic if that's okay. 
Yes, sounds good. Kalakesa. Tulo mo pulo tulangi mo mama. Tulo mo kamata anga. Tulo mo mana sinua. Tulo mo mana sonua. Tulo mo tala kotoa. Kaya ata kima to of atongia. Umanga fako vahia. We salute the Lord Langin Mama. We salute our sacred beginnings. We salute Mana Finua, Indigenous lands and people of Aotearoa. We salute Moana Fonua, Indigenous lands and people of the wider Moana Oceania. We salute all sacred knowledges and may we be allowed to take responsibility of the tasks we allocated today. Kia ora ofa, talo falava, kia ora koutou katoa, and aloha to you all on this virtual platform. My name is Golokesa Wafa Mahinatuai, and I will be sharing with you all uh, today on behalf of myself and my Hoasoa partner, Tuluma Anave Barbara Makwati Afitu, who is also on this platform with us um, this afternoon here in Aotearoa, and on behalf of our extended Langi Mama Fanao Aingan family. Um, firstly, we want to acknowledge and say Malo Alpito, Fafsai Tele Lava, Mahalo Nulo to Noel. Kahanu, the Bishop Museum, and all those involved in this Regeneration Program series. Um, and also, we want to acknowledge our fellow um, panelists, uh, Joy and Brandy. Um, okay, so I'll get into it. I think just to kind of declare, <laughs> you know, we've 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 run a lot of digital platforms, and we've actually had, you know, um, a lot of these platforms who've been recorded and put up, and we've had a lot of, you know, some of our communities come back and kind of, you know, be offended with some of the things we've said. So I've I've resorted to writing my thoughts down, <laughs> you know, just because I know this is going to be recorded and put up. But um, just to go back to the question is. Um, you know, tell us about your work and how you engage with issues regarding um, digital collections. So, as Noel mentioned in our bio, the work that we do is Langi Mama involves mediating at the intersection of Moana Oceania communities and cultural institutions to shift the axis of Western imposition and domination to Indigenous liberation through embedding our different ways of knowing, seeing, and doing. At the heart of what we do is working with our communities for our communities. And every project that we have worked on since we formally established Langi Mama in August 2018 has been to address the vast knowledge gap within and across the cultural space here in Aotearoa, but also beyond our shores. And we joke around that we are, our hashtag is hashtag knowledge gap fillers. <laughs> However, Tuluma Nave and I are merely the mediators. This is where the united yet diverse knowledge and expertise of our living communities come in. Within and across our living communities today are individuals that are part of collectives who have been and continue to be our indigenous ontopistemologists or discoverers and developers, experimenters, verifiers, refiners of our diverse bodies of indigenous knowledges and practices that have been generations carried and refined. Just you know, with, with um, going back to what you've already shared, Joy and Brandy. Um, so how do we engage with issues regarding digital collections? For us and what we do, um, digital has become just another medium or tool in our basket of tools for sharing knowledge, and that's our indigenous knowledge. It wasn't by first choice, but more of a necessity and our need to adapt to the realities of our current global battle against COVID-19. That is what led us to set up two digital platforms, our Langi Mama Talk Story Tuesdays and Langi Mama Dalano Thursdays platforms. Both of these digital platforms are components of two ongoing research projects. Talk Story Tuesdays is linked to our Arts of Moana Oceania research, which is an attempt to balance the current knowledge gap within and across the cultural sector here in Aotearoa on what art is from the different lens of the 17 island nations that have diaspora communities here in Aotearoa. However, we know that there won't just be 17 definitions of art, as Aotearoa Census also has an other box <laughs> with our small, smaller island nations. And in addition, we have the cultural and linguistic diversity within and across nations like Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, for example. But for us, addressing the 17 is a start because our cultural sector today is still operating on an ignorant knowledge and understanding that there is such a thing as just one way of knowing, seeing, and doing art for our Moana Shinya people. Our second digital platform, Langi Mama Dalano Thursdays, is linked to our Unity and Diversity and Diversity and Unity Research Project where we again sought to fill a knowledge gap around some of John Weber's works by providing the missing multiple indigenous narratives. We wanted to bring together for the first, for the first time, 
are bodies of indigenous knowledges and narratives specific to the weather plates that were part of the official publication of Captain James Cook's third and final voyage. Weber was the expedition artist on this voyage and he captured um, images representing the island nations of Aotearoa, Cook Islands, Tonga, Society Islands, Tahiti and Huahine in Hawaii. Our why is that these Weber images have been and continue to be widely used and referenced within and across cultural and academic spaces in the past and today. And it is more pertinent now with the global movement practice shift of cultural institutions making their collections available online which include these river images. So it is timely that we provide a more balanced and holistic context around these images by including our missing indigenous narratives and finally correcting culturally offensive information that continue to be perpetuated because they have not yet been corrected. And for example, as a Tongan working in what is known here in Aotearoa as the GLAM, Galleries, Libraries, Archives and Museum Spaces, I really did not want to keep seeing our 36th Duitonga Pao continue to be referenced as either Tuitonga Po Laho, meaning King of Tonga Po with testicle, or Tuitonga Pao Laho, meaning King of Tonga Testicle Pao. So let's correct it already so that it reads now and forevermore Tuitonga Pao and translated as Pao, King of Tonga. Um, so going back to the question of how we engage with issues regarding digital collections, we can say that our Talk Story Tuesdays and Balanor Thursdays platforms were both delivered on Zoom and all our sessions were recorded, first and foremost, as part of our own documentation of each project. So in this sense, we do hold digital collections that are made up of 12 Talk Story Tuesday sessions and five Dalamore Thursday sessions. For all of our projects, including these two, we choose only to partner up with cultural organizations that will allow us to lead in the way we do and also have the openness for us to be flexible in whatever direction we are led by our community. And just a note that this has also been a journey in itself. And for our digital flat platforms, there's always a discussion around providing access to the recordings posted session, which we are always open to, but we are also very clear that it will only be made available with the permission of our indigenous ontopistemologists that shared. So we don't really see it as issues, but just part of our responsibility of making sure that we are always led by our community. And of the nine island nations that we covered with our first phase of our Talk Story Tuesdays platform that actually concluded in September last year, we are only just getting to the point of having five of these recordings ready to be shared a year later. And this has involved a process of toying and throwing with all of our Indigenous onto epistemologists to review their recordings, make a decision on whether they, um, you know, we include the presentation as well as the Q&A and then work with a professional film company, Raro Dog, run by Robert George, who's of Cook Islands Heritage, to tidy up our simple attempts of record keeping. And to ensure we had a full control of how the recordings will be shared, answers and, in, and answer any queries and requests, we made the decision only at that moment to set up our Langinama website. So in the words of my horse, Tulumatnave, when we ask our Indo, um, Indigenous onto epistemologists in our Moana Oceania communities to gift their knowledge to some of our projects, this doesn't just happen. It's not, um, it's not immediate, it's built over years, sometimes through intergenerational relationships or new relationships. So there's a huge amount of building trust and responsibility, often trust that is sacred and responsibility that is ours as Lagi Mama to create as safe a space as possible. Okay, I'm gonna pass it on. <laughs> So as somebody who has participated in some of these Lagi Mama programs, I just want to attest to the sense of community and the sense of trust and sort of sacred space that is created, even in this sort of bizarre digital platform world that we exist in right now. And that's, that is a testament to, I think, one of the, the tremendous benefits of um, the, this digital platform and this digital world that we live in, the fact that, that we are so geographically distant in that sense and yet can come together as a community. Um, the, the, the next question is, what do you see as some of the benefits and challenges to digital approaches for Indigenous communities? Um, some of which we've already touched on already, but I just want to kind of dive in a little deeper into that question. 
And maybe I can frame it also by just sharing that um, I'm working on a project. We recently got funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Native Hawaiian Library Project. And it's for the Hui Panala'ao Digital Collection of which, um, so it's about creating access across seven repositories, one repository of which, and a main one at that is Bishop Museum. And so this idea that we can tell this story uh, a largely hidden story for a really long time about Native Hawaiian men, young men, some of them teenagers, who were sent by the United States government to colonize islands in the Pacific. Um, for seven years, actually, more than 135 of them were there from 1935 to 1942. But I think the idea that we can connect a story about say a log book. So here's this young man writing in a journal and we can link his words to photographs that might exist in a different repository to letters that he wrote as a Kamehameha school student saying, can you send the money I'm making to my parents to a document in um, Washington DC that reveals that our native Hawaiians were getting paid $3 a day when, um, when furloughed military personnel who were doing the same job were getting $5 a day. So I think, you know, there's a tremendous value to be able to connect disparate items and create a holistic, a more whole picture that really empowers us to understand um, what was happening um, to them, as well as what their experiences were, right? So we, I, so I don't want to, um, at least for myself, imply that that there is only really uh, sort of negative issues that come out of this, but to understand that there are both benefits, but but legitimate concerns that we have where we should approach carefully and not as Joyce says, kind of like access to the capital A and sort of throw open the doors, right? Um, so yeah, so um, again, in case we forgot, the second question is, uh, what do you all see as some of the benefits and challenges to digital approaches for indigenous communities? And I won't put Joy on the spot, if anybody else wants to start off, maybe Brandy, how are you feeling? I guess I can go first. I'm always, I always hate going first. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't go. I don't, I don't know if I should be the first one to speak about this. Um, so um, I sit in a space where I, I think that there, I think there can be a lot of benefits if the community wants the cultural resources and the items online. And I think like, what does that look like? Um, and so I, I do, um, I, I think that there are some platforms that we have partnered with, um, a couple of, with, with Jane Anderson and Kim Kristen, um, around with Mukaduk in the past, and they're still working with Mukaduk, which is a platform for, it's like for, um, uh, it's for like collections management, but it's really ran and it has to be led by indigenous community members and then they decide what is public access, what is their community access and it has these different spaces and so we we would love to launch that at the museum, but the communities that we're currently working with. They're, that's not one of their priorities. Their priority is repatriation and so fully recognizing that we as an institution and an organization we meet the wants and needs of the community, even though it would be amazing to launch this. It's not my place to force them if that's not a priority. They want their ancestors back and their belongings back. And so um, that's kind of where we as an organization are. However, that doesn't mean that there's still not really some great examples of communities that have ha have made that a priority because that's something that they have the capacity at this time to continue to invest in in time. So there's examples where like the Passamaquoddy community has launched um, websites. There's gathering where um, a, a gathering of indigenous communities in uh, Northern Washington have partnered and they have created a platform um, where they're also showing their cultural resources. And then you can see seasonality when cultural resources can be viewed and in the wintertime or in the springtime and then there's music and song that's also layered on 
I think it does, there's also presents challenges in terms of free access towards sound, right? When you think about that being an open space and what does that look like, um, which can be a challenge, but also these songs, some of these songs are meant to be heard and it's the community's decision if they share it. And I think that that's also really beautiful. Like, what does it mean to, to be able to have these gifts from community members that, and what is it to be reciprocal back? Um, I think about in the context of kind of where I think um, when we think about it for the museum, it's just uh, is is really what does it mean to make sure that we're continuing to grow with the community and adapt as they want. Um, yeah, and so I, I think another option for what we're hoping to do is to be able to see um, for um, the digital curation of cultural resources and pieces of material cultures, how do we create access points so that communities know that we have their cultural resources if they want them repatriated back, especially under our colonial pathways policy that says anything in our cultural resources that came to us through colonial pathways, if they want them back, then it's going home, it should go home. I'm including their ancestors. And so we're right now really exploring as to how do we create these digital platforms that show folks their community members what they have as well as still continuing to recognize that what does it mean for the consent of putting information out there and trying to find that space of balance um, because they can't ask for things back if they don't know that we have it right and we can't just be blasting ceremonial and cultural resources and ancestors and so um i'm not sure what the answer is yet and i don't know if i will have the answers really i'm not the expert um is until we start connecting with community members and they tell us what they want similar to with the kumiai community so far everyone said please take everything that you had online down um and so we've just re we've responded to that and, and sit in a space to where um if they want us to put items online then we can um yeah i, I don't uh, other than i feel like joy and um Kola Kessa probably have more because this is, is sitting in your space, but we really are like, what is the wants and needs of community? How do we make sure we're honoring those um, as much as we can uh, as a community or as a museum that is just consistently perpetrated colonial harm? Um, thank you, Brandy. I'm wondering, do you want to just say a little bit about this Google um, Arts project that you did? Because I do think it's a it's not an anomaly, but it's really, it's a new, it's, it, you guys chose to take a different path and to utilize this platform to really talk about decolonization, decolonization square on. So can you just share yeah. about that? I love this exhibit <laughs> because, but, and it is really responding to um, the community's wants and needs when they, what they've been asking us to talk about our museum. It was built in 1915. It is a monument to the colonizers. It, on the facade, it has nine colonizers etched into the skin of the building. It's Spanish colonial. From the top to the bottom, there are colonizers and the iconography as well. We've never talked about it outside of celebrating them and uplifting their colonial legacy. And communities have consistently asked and wanted and demanded, and we've ignored their voices. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we had uh, Google Arts and Culture approached us and wanted to, they knew we had 75,000 ethnographic items, cultural resources in our holding at the moment um, until we can repatriate them back um, and asked us to do a Google Arts and Culture exhibit because we had all of the resources. Um, and we really set in a space, and this is where our department, my department decolonizing initiatives pushed back and was like, we made a commitment to communities that they've asked us not to put their cultural resources on. We don't have consent to put these cultural resources on. And so we pushed back with Google and we said, you know, this is what we stand for. And these are our, our, our goals. These are our guiding principles, our decolonial guiding principles. Um, and this is our commitment to indigenous communities and explained why. Um, and Google came back and was like, that makes sense. And okay, what do you want? Um, versus we thought they would be like, no, we don't want a relationship at all because that has happened in the past. Um, and so then we really push forward and say, you know, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to show. Um, and this is the story. And so we ended up leaning in um, to that challenging conversation, leaning into um, what does it look like to work with Google and educate and recognize decolonial processes um, and so now we have an exhibit that moves through talking about the building, talking about these colonizers, also account that in the first three slides, it's accountability to our colonial legacy, where we fully recognize that we have perpetrated erasure to indigenous peoples that we haven't listened to them for over 100 years. And now, like, and we've uplifted this story of their colonizing of the, uh, the areas um, and the ways that they've harmed indigenous communities. And so really making sure that this was a platform for truth telling and accountability 
and then moving into what it looks like to talk about the space and to talk about how we are shifting that paradigm of look at this really fancy object that we stole and how amazing because we own it and let's talk about about indigenous communities versus with indigenous communities and by indigenous communities but now really talking about the whole story of the ways in which we've perpetrated harm and other folks have perpetrated harm and histories erased oh, mahalo for that okay the uh, coin toss between joy and color <laughs> All right, since you calling me out, I'm gonna do it. Um, the benefits, so when I think about the benefits, there's, there's an example of an exhibition that happened in 2012 in Australia in Queensland called Transforming Tyndale, Transforming Tyndale uh, who was this anthropologist in 1938 who went out and took 1100 photographs of, a tri of Aboriginal tribes um, in seven different communities over a seven month period. And this guy's huge, right? And they have little VIN numbers next to them. And it's this huge physical collection. And this artist, this Aboriginal artist, Vernon Aki, uh, and I forget the name of the curator that he worked with, this other Aboriginal curator, they he, he went in and he's related, like, so his relatives are a part of, the, of this collection. And, they're, they're like this big and you can carry, and he first found out about them because his grandmother had had copies of, the, of them in her, in her purse. And, and he was like, what are these things? And she's like, well, this guy came and he took these photos, right? And when you think about the stolen generations of, of um, Australia, to have any photograph at all of your ancestors is incredibly important. So what he did, he, he took those images and he made them bigger than life, the size of a wall. And he brought in community members to basically have these huge, these wonderful community gatherings to share stories and like share the stories around the lost, uh, the, of the stolen generations, to reclaim those photos, to, to have people actually add to the meaning and the meta, like the metadata of those photographs and not only that, so this is in the, the John Oxley Library, but there and in Queensland, there's restrictions on those photographs, right? The restrictions are that only the people that are the descendants. So they have a list of names of who's in it, that you, right? But only the people that are related can get the full family tree. That's if they have it. Only the families that are related can get access to the photographs, right? Um, and, and get a copy of the photographs. Like, so if you wanna, so basically, if you're a researcher, you'd have to like, you have to like go through some things. You have to work for access to this collection. And then what do you need access for it? Any, like, what are you trying to prove in this? This is a really like, so it's taking basically like the Lewis Sullivan collection, a, a really messed up anthropologic, right? Eugenics, uh, scientific racist project, right? So they can prove white people are better, indigenous people are this, and reclaiming it and saying, okay, well, thanks for taking these photos of us. There's all kinds of issues with, but actually you've actually, you've been able to capture this image of, right? And there's a reason that people say capture an image, take an image, because the things that we don't always talk about, especially in this world where everybody's got a camera all the time for everything, here's my food, here's my this, here's my that. We're just surveillance, giving all of the information to the government um, about what we're doing at every minute. Um, is that the the to be able to put restrictions on those photographs, to be able to say we as the subject own the photograph. We as the subject. It's not the repository that holds it, right? That's a report like. A museum or a library, that's all they are. They're a repository. You're just holding it for somebody else. You stole it probably, right? So somebody stole it and they stole it and they gave it to you and then you stole it and you kept it. And right. So one of the things that disturbs me is when I see little watermarks on images of Kanaka of like the museum. Right. Don't put a watermark on my ancestor or on our ancestors, right? I just, oh, it just it just does something to me. But we don't actually talk about this a lot, right? 
you know, because on the one hand, you're just like, well, we can't really get mad at the state archives. We can't get mad at these guys for this and that because they're creating access for us. I'm like, yeah, but we could do this in an entirely different way. It's not, it, the question isn't access, it's where is the respect for the access? Where is the real thinking and the deep thinking for the community? Where is the genealogy? Like, how do we respect our ancestors in this, right? Um, and it gets really, and, it, and it's, it still gets complicated, right? There's still, it's not, it's not, it's not easy and it's not, but I like complex, right? We have to be able to really dig deep into the complexity of it because we are a complex, we are complex peoples, right? We are nuanced peoples. No two people look at an image the same way, no, and right, and so we need to really think about access and thinking about that, but getting into to debates about who, who actually owns and has agency with their image. If you take a photo of me, that's my image. You need consent, right? So we know that all these anthropological photos between Sullivan and Tyndale and whoever, they didn't have consent necessarily. I'm not taking away any agency of the people who sat there, right? Because maybe they did give them. Maybe they're like, okay, I'm really curious about your your camera. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and like see what happens with this experience. But you know, now when we say we you no longer have consent to have my image, the other side needs to hear you no longer have consent to have my image. And that's where we get into big fights, right? That's where we get into big fights because, but you know, like, but you have to prove provenance. How can you prove that that's you? Why should, you know, like, we'll give you a copy. Nah, I didn't ask you for that. I asked you for my image. This is ours. This is my family's. When, if, if, we, if we die and we say, okay, leave it there, that's a different conversation. Then if I say, if we as, as, as the descendants of those photographs say, give it back, right? We get into, right, because, you know, it can end up in an art project. It can end up, you know, it can end up in all kinds of different places. I don't want to be somebody, I don't necessarily want to be somebody's research project, right? I, I don't want to keep being a subject for someone else's desires, right? So when we, when we think about the great things about digital collections is, yes, they can, I mean, I've been able to find ancestors that I didn't even know I had, right? I've been able to find clippings to things it's been amazing, right? And like you were saying, Noel, you can come through digital collections, you can bring collections together and make an entire composite of an entire genealogy. That's amazing, right? But we should be able to do it on our own terms. And that's where the pitfalls are, right? Because we're dealing with centuries of colonial theft, right? And in and, and, and a sort of imperial privilege to our lives, right? So anyway, I'll on that, I'll toss it over to Kulakesa. Kulakesa, can I jump in real quick? Just is something that hit me when just, and I, I feel like I, I hope you're also, but I, I really, so this context of ownership, right? When we're talking about that and becoming subjects and people owning us, owning our pictures, owning our resources, owning our relatives, why are we still calling it the Sullivan Collection? Why are we like at, at the museum? Why are we calling it the Hubs Collection when he is the one who like stole from our ancestors and that they're the ones that continue to hoard our images and now continue to take ownership. And yet in the ways that we as museums display, the ways that we're talking about them, the ways that an exhibit is curated, we're still saying, the Sullivan collection and giving the ownership and the power to the colonizer, to the person who perpetrated the harm. And yet we as we're so complacent in it because that's the label that we've given. I just I, I just wanted to bring that in too, because I think that this that's a part of the conversation, how we're consistently in this cycle. Hashtag yes and cats, Brandy. <laughs> I've I've written something, but um I guess that, you know, going back to what I was talking about earlier around the Unity and Diversity, Diversity Unity Project and the John Weber images, that is exactly what we're trying to do. You know, yes, we can't erase what has already taken in the past, but we can bring our narrative so it can sit there, you know, and, and correct, um, yeah, correct all that. But anyway, in answering the next question is what do you see as some of the benefits and challenges to digital approaches for indigenous communities in the work that we do um, as Langimama is that we only took a digital approach with our Langimama Talk Story Tuesdays and Dharano Thursdays because of the impact of COVID-19. But in hindsight, it worked out better because we weren't restricted to engaging 
only with our Indigenous onto-epistemologists within and across Aotearoa, we could go beyond our shores, and we did. We also had a global audience. Toluma Anave and I are both technologically challenged and actually prefer face-to-face -face interaction. But after experiencing a couple of Zoom meetings, we thought this platform is relatively easy to off, um, enough to operate. It also has a recording feature that we can utilize to document our project. And on top of that, we were receiving heartfelt messages, feedback from our diaspora communities all over the world that they were hugely thankful for the digital platform where they had access to knowledge directly from our Indigenous onto epistemologists that they would not normally have. However, despite the benefits of a digital approach, we were always conscious of the technical barriers of this digital medium, particularly for our older generations of whom were predominantly our onto epistemologists that gifted to our two projects. So it was a process of Barbara schooling herself to then be able to have 101 sessions with communities on how to log on, for example. And the other biggest challenge is that a digital platform also exposes you to virtual attacks that are beyond your control. And we experienced this earlier on with only our second talk story where we were Zoom bombed. While both Barbara and I were shocked and traumatized because who knew there was such a thing, we were getting messages from our community to please get back on so that we can continue. And we did, and we, um, and we finished an hour and a half later. So despite the traumatic experiences, it was a moment of learning where we then worked with our partner organizations at that time and space to put in the registration system. And while these processes still required navigation, you learn and refine your processes as you go. But for us, the biggest challenge was in knowing what we were compromising in terms of all of the intangibles that come from having a face-to-face -face physical gathering and interacting to now having to create the environment on a digital platform. So the sharing of knowledge that took place on our two digital platforms is only a small part of the bigger picture of the ways that we approach the work that we do. So when we invite our Indigenous epistemologists to come on board our project, we ensure that we support them in all areas. For example, transparency, setting key expectations from the start with parameters to ensure their knowledge is acknowledged and protected. And most importantly, being transparent with um, them on where the knowledge that they're gifting will be used and how it will be used. And the other key area is remuneration, acknowledging that our indigenous knowledge that has been generations carried, nurtured, protected, um, is being brought into the space to then inform a particular space. So we make sure we budget, you know, that you, um, uh, an amount that you would pay an expert or consultant knowing often that our onto epistemologists that come on board, you know, will gift a lot more. So we kind of do away with the whole um, mea lofa, mea ofa, you know, which is a, a gesture of thank you, where if you're going to pay other consultants, consultancy rate will so our communities need, need and deserve that um, as well. And the other key area is published papers. We acknowledge the published word as another powerful medium to get our indigenous knowledge out there. So we want wanted to infiltrate the current written scholarship that have been written by others about us and our cultures and heritages with actual writings by us. Um, so that was why um, writing and publishing is a key component of every project that we're doing. And while we set up Langimama, while we set up our Langimama website specifically to have a platform where we can share the digital recordings from our project, it has become an important platform for us to publish the papers from these two projects. And again, we ensure that our budget includes remuneration for their papers. Um, the other area is uh, um, a platform where we talk story at Balanoa, which is a concept and practice, our own indigenous concept and practice. So we wanted to acknowledge that despite um, getting our thinking and feeling into a, a, a published paper format, we wanted to acknowledge the richness of our oral, oral based cultures where we set up the Talk Story and Dalinor platform so that our Indigenous onto epistemologists could talk to what they gifted in their written text, which varied from a quote to a 53 page document with all of their papers. And as mentioned er um, earlier, the impacts of COVID 19 meant that we had to adapt and deliver these online. So um, I'll refer back to to the sharing of my horse, Soa Tulema Nave, who um, said that when speaking from an indigenous context, we need to let those who we are inviting into the Salanod to lead, tell us what tikanga or cultural protocol looks like for them. For us here in Aotearoa, for example, we always know and acknowledge mana whenua, tangata whenua, 
as the people of this land. And in many cases, we will ask them to open and close our Dalanoa because it is right. And this is what we did with our Talk Story Tuesdays platform. And in some cases, we will invite the elders of the indigenous communities we are working with to guide and lead the protocols, cultural protocols, which is what we did with our Dalanoa Thursdays. And this is done through Dalanoa, through trust and through cultural respect of just stepping back. People are often trying to project manage and put into a run sheet um, tikanga and culture. And with my horse boy, Samoan, she says, as a Samoan, I only know what I know as a Samoan. The rest I will clear space um, for because it's not my space to hold. And I will leave it at that and I'll pass it on. <laughs> hmm. Thank you so much. There's so many um, threads and connectivity that really exists through all of what um, has been shared. And I guess, you know, the third question here is what is the future of indigenous um, digital curation and where do you see us headed? But I'd actually like to go back to kind of the beginning of the conversation and this idea of where the root of curation came from, one of which is, is cura, cura, right? Which is to cure, to heal, in addition to care for. So I'm wondering, like, can we envision ways in which digital curation can be utilized in ways that help to heal community? And, you know, I guess, is there hope? Do we see hope in, in this area, which is only going to get exponentially bigger and bigger, like the, the, the Pandora's, you know what I mean? I, just, I don't want to use that term, but you know what I mean? The, the, like, sorry, the box has been open. Like, how do, how, you can't put it back in. So now what? And how do we reclaim this trajectory in a way that pivots it toward notions of care and healing for our communities? Okay, I'm gonna ask for volunteers. I don't wanna like tag anybody. I actually got a lot to say on this one. So I, I, um, when I, when I think about the future of this, there's, there's a lot of things, right? Like we need to control the material. We also need to have the platforms, be trained in the platforms to be able to handle that material digitally, which takes tremendous amounts of resources actually, right? We know this, like there's like the server on top of the server on top of the server to make sure that those things, because we know that this is a non-stable platform. I mean, we're, we're, we're wobbly just in this Zoom meeting, right? Um, we're like, oh, your internet is wobbly. It's an unstable connection. It is a not stable connection, which is why you, you listen to a lot of people like, oh, it's digital. You can just scan it. You put it on your computer and it's, it's done and you're, you're good to go and you can throw the thing away. Don't throw it away. Don't throw the actual thing away because when your computer crashes or you got a corrupted file or and you've just, just you've just lost all that thing and you don't have the thing, which is what a lot of people have moved to doing, which they tell you minimalism and all this kind of stuff. Like we're moving toward this, like we still need to sort of to like, there's still gotta be that balance with the material culture. And I think, but we as indigenous people, we're so amazing, right? I mean, who could be more resilient than us? in terms of being able to move and shift with, okay, I was like, okay, yet one more thing of you all trying to prevent access to, uh, for us to get to our stuff. Here's, then, you, then we've created, a, we literally always have to create our own platforms, our own protocols for literally every, for every new technology, we've created something to intervene so that we survive, right? So I think in terms of just give it, like give, in the amount of shifts that we're seeing in terms of uh, access to technology, to film and to all these other platforms that we're seeing among indigenous people globally, that that will grow. At the same time, the, the other side of this will all, is also growing. And so we need to be able to, to remember that 
these are things in our body, right? So that's why I always come back and say, even like, yes, we need to hold these technologies. We need to, we need to get in on that. But this is also something like, it still means so much more to me if I could name all the winds and the rains in, in my language, right? It would mean so much more for me to be able to name all the clouds. That will always be with me, right? That, that can be passed on forever, which is why we still exist because we have those chants, because we have that way of embodying our archives. We are the archives, we hold it on our tongue. We hold it in our dance and in our, right? And in our song and everything. And so we, that, that's where I see this going is that, especially towards climate change, we hold it in our body, we have it in the physical form and in this virtual platform, knowing that this virtual space is just, it's space, it's, 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 not, it's not stable. We are the stability in this. Um, and that's just my soapbox for now. I'm gonna pass that on. <laughs> Wow, mm, lots, lots to think about. And so, yes, Brandy or Colacessa. I went first last time. It's your turn, Colacessa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brandy, I'll go. But oh, I'm going to read what I wrote because I feel like I need to. But just I want to respond to what you're sharing and um, what you shared, Joy. Where I guess that with everything that we've done, knowledge is the key. Like you're saying, it's embedded, it's in our lineage, it's in, in our DNA. And, and for our communities, our living communities, it's interesting when you hear conversations and you've got all these research projects and researchers who want to, um, you know, study and research our collections, you know, from, you know, sort of early explorers period. But, oh, the living communities won't know about it because they weren't there. It's like, OMG, you're not acknowledging that this knowledge has been continue to be passed on but you just don't acknowledge, acknowledge it because why oh because that person doesn't have a PhD you know that's come from an institution that's not our cultural institution so yes totally love what you've just shared and I'm going to go back to my script <laughs> just in answer I think just because it'll speak to to what you've also um, shared in a while but the question is in terms of what is the future of Indigenous digital curation and where do you see us headed so um, and I'm going to resort to the, the words of Toluma Nave, where, she, you know, in our conversation, she shared, we were approached by an organization who were keen for us to be part of a platform that were building, that they were building around sharing our koloa, messy in the cultural heritage, digitally. Our first question was, do you have the budget for our Indigenous onto epistemologists to be paid, which they did not, so we lovingly opted to not join. This is only one of many issues that come to mind, which we've all raised in our Dalanoa in terms of what should be shared and what shouldn't, whose responsibility, responsibility is it to make that call? How can we hold cultural institutions responsible for engaging with the communities of whom these Goloa Messi and the cultural heritage connect to? So often we are forced to enter into partnerships where the strings are being pulled or restrained by sponsors. Some organizations are often after ticks, which are not ours, so we are often having to compromise ourselves. That is why Langi Mama feel blessed because we are independent and answerable, answerable only to our communities, elders, and our families who are our biggest and loudest critics. And as an independent organization, we are able to go into spaces or say things that we know many of our dearest working in the glam um, spaces can't. And we both know what it's like to work within institutions because we met while working in one. But both, we both made a decision to leave because we had to, not because we wanted to. But as Langi Mama, we now have tangibles from work we have done with our communities that speak for themselves and are shifting hearts and minds. So we are grateful, but also hugely conscious of what responsibility comes with that. Aotearoa is small and the work we, that we have done in our three years have critically challenged cultural institutions to address the massive indigenous knowledge gaps within and across the ways of knowing, seeing and doing. And the unfortunate reality is that some cultural institutions and key decision makers working within and across those institutions, which sadly includes our own communities, take offense to our indigenous approaches of Dalanoa, which is talking critically yet harmoniously, but we will keep working towards the greater and we are hugely grateful for those that have faith and trust in our knowing, seeing and doing and are choosing to walk alongside and with us as we koia tala 
words of wisdom and encouragement from our Malaitan onto epistemologist Dr. Kabi Nisanga from Malaita in the Solomon Islands, who gifted to our talk story Tuesdays by saying that, quote, we say in Malaita, you are Koyatala, you are people who are clearing eh, the first path in that space. People who Koyatala are not only walking along the path, they're actually creating the path as they walk as well on it, end of quote. So I guess the answer to the question is that when you have our communities at the heart of what you do and are open to being led by them and also being growled by them, then the future of any indigenous medium of curation, including digital curation, will see your communities walking with and beside you. That's when you know you're heading in the right direction, wherever that may be. So yeah, that's me, tag. Um. So I, uh, I is it is it Jane or G Jian Jan? Um, please forgive me for mispronouncing your um, name, uh, possibly mispronouncing your name. I really appreciate what you're saying, and I also bringing in communities in diaspora, because um, that's really where I I think about, and I I am a person of hope, as Noel <laughs> may know me uh, from hearing kind of the way I talk about decolonial work. Um, I. I think the future is decolonial work. Like, what does it look like to redress colonial harm? What does it look like to hold these institutions, these beings, these colonizers accountable? Um, and what does it mean to move uh, and build a better future for the present, build a better future for generations? Um, and that, what does it look like for communities in diaspora, right? And so I think about when digital curation and what does it mean for cultural resources? Um, and that's some of the work that we are working on engaging with communities, especially Maya community members right now, and we're working on reframing a, an exhibit, but parts of what we've been talking with them about is what does it look like for access to in the cultural resources that the museum currently stewards from the community um, that were taken from their homeland, but what does it look like to create spaces for Maya communities and diaspora around the world, and what does it look like to connect community members to those relatives? Um, versus like even just thinking about repatriation. So we've talked quite a bit in terms of um, what does it mean to have augmented reality um, in these spaces? Uh, what does it look like to have virtual reality or even to create spaces? I don't know, that's outside of my wheelhouse, but I like the context of partnering with folks and partnering with other indigenous folks that are thinking about this through their own indigenous ways of knowing and being and building it through these platforms, through that innovation. It's really exciting to me, uh, and I, I see that as a space of the future in terms of what does it look like for building these bridges, what does it look like for connecting community members to their relatives um, all over the world. Uh, so I, I'm really excited about that. I don't, we don't have that yet, but it may be, maybe soon, right? <laughs> like that's where I, I'm, I'm hoping, um, and where. I feel like when I think about the decolonial drop of water consistently hitting these like monuments that don't move, like that's one of the holes that it's just gonna blast through is what does that look like? What does access look like through that? Um, and, and I also agree completely with Kolakesa and with Joy. And I just think about how, how do you, how does ancestral knowledge manifest in these spaces? Um, and I, it makes me really excited. The I don't know is what makes me really excited. Um, I don't know, this, this feels like such an emotional topic. And so I want to thank you guys for, for the kind of the vulnerability of going, going to these places. And so one of the things that I'm hearing is that the, the underlying relationship, the protocol, the respect that exists for between the community and between the actual physical, the, the, the physical, either Tonga or Mea Vai Vai, it, that still applies even if it now is in a digital form. Like there's no, that just because the data points or the, the manner in which it now appears in a digital context does not remove the, the necessity of the protocol to care for that, that, to give it the same respect that is due. And this idea, I think that Joy really talks about the temporal, the temporal nature of that, to understand that this, this 
you know, what we're thinking as, oh yeah, this is the permanent way moving forward is actually the least permanent in many respects, right? So, and, you know, and, and then thinking about even the naming, like we've seen it change over time, this idea that it went from Captain Cook's cloak to Kalani Opu's cloak, you know, just in, just in our generation, you know, how our relationships to collections have changed over time. And, and, the, and the biggest one really is consent, right? Consent, consent, consent with a capital C. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, what I'm hearing um, through this conversation. And I just, you know, at this point, before we open it up for, for other questions, I just really want to know, is there, is there anything that you guys want to, talk about or say or ask of each other um, in the, in, but yeah, before we open it up. I, I just, one thing, one thing that, that um, we, we sometimes don't talk about is allowing objects to have a natural life, right? particularly in museum, like, so when you go into a virtual world, you're extending the life of something that maybe would not go that much longer. Um, and on the one hand, we mourn those things that we lose over time, right? right? Um, like maybe if a cloak breaks down over time or, you know, other objects, a, a basket or, or other objects break down, um, but things that that have a natural life. Our objects have a natural life. Our photographs even have a natural life. They're light on paper. Like the paper deteriorates over time. When we move to these virtual places, we we may be extending an image, uh, uh, an object, uh, something that's ceremonial, something that has so much deep meaning beyond what it's supposed to last. I don't know why I just got all emotional about it, but I, I always think about the natural life of, of an object that it's like we, we so that whole thing when we talk about uh, bone copies and you know like these casts and all these other things you're not allowing people's bones to rest when you make copies of them you're not allowing a person's mana to to go into and become another form when you cast their body when you cast their face um, and you hold it and you think you can reproduce it and reproduce it and reproduce it um, same thing with a photograph, right? A photograph is, is totally reproducible. It's a me mechanical object. And so it, it loses that sort of natural life. I, I don't know how long I want my image to be held in space indefinitely, uh, right? I, I, mean, I, I mean, maybe it's a great thing. I don't know, for, for like for me, right? Like I grew up in the diaspora, like having, being able to get, you know, get access to people, that lived two, you know, two centuries ago, or you know, over a hundred years ago. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But I also there's many other ancestors that I don't have that access to. There's many other objects that they held that, that had meaning for them that I know nothing about. But that doesn't mean I don't know them. And so, that's the other issue for me around digital um, platforms and digital spaces: is what are we doing to the natural life of an object? That's all. I'm just sorry. I don't know why I got all emotional. About it. <laughs> right. And even, you know, even embedded in this idea of ki'i or image, like the ki'i has as much mana as the actual initial object that inspired it. Right. I mean, so the idea that that a ki'i could be used toward um toward negative ends, you know what I mean? Like, like the life still perpetuates in images of it. So, you know, and a lot of times say, because we, you know, the, this idea of um, EV kupuna, our ancestors were raised. Um, if you return or repatriate an individual, but yet the photograph of them still remains behind in the museum, you are continuing to perpetuate their exposure and their harm and their shame by allowing access to that image, even though they themselves physically were returned. 
So we always have to remember that just because you have this physical return, what are all the manifestations that continue to exist, including actually data? So when we go back to issues about data sovereignty too, right? That's a whole nother panel presentation that could be had. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, again, sort of rights and access to that, to all of these manifestations. And again, that goes back to like, who, who has been sort of exploited, whose images have been, have been um, taken and exploited and commercialized, you know what I mean? Like, with no profit back or benefit to the community. You know, there's so many ways in which um, harm has been perpetuated and we're only just scratching the surface. But yeah, so is there anything that you guys wanna add before we open it up for a Q&A with the audience? I'm thinking, <laughs> I think just, you know, just as someone who's come through the museum space where you, you know, you see your communities who are working within these colonial institutions and they have sort of an unnatural, <laughs> you know, with, with your, what you're saying, Joy, where their whole remit is the preservation forever of whatever is in there. Um, you know, whatever they, they have in their collections, which, you know, you can apply to, to this digital space, you know, but the key thing is, is that the powers and the knowledge <laughs> around that, you know, like, um, you think you, it, it, it's different, like with photographs and images of your ancestors and whether it's a physical, you know, um, uh, taonga of your ancestors, but, you know, I think it's, it's, we are still one up in the sense that we have that knowledge that is continue to be passed on within our living communities, irrespective of these institutions, you know? And I think that's what, you've got a lot of these cultural institutions now. This is just me making a statement from just experiences of the, what we've um, experienced of working here in Aotearoa is, you know, with the whole wanting to be inclusive and diverse and, and the whole sort of privileging indigenous knowledge, what does that mean? Um, because they're now acknowledging actually, yeah, they, they have some information, they know of some things, like especially around the naming that you mentioned, Brandy, where some collections, is the, you know, it's only known via the collector's name, <laughs> you know, hence why institutions are wanting to engage communities to breathe life back into it, but it's a one-way process, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the work that we are all doing is we're trying to ensure that it is a two-way thing and that we are um, coming in with agency where we are the ones dictating what, what information, you know, we want to give. But, but I think, I, I don't know, my thoughts are everywhere, but basically it's like, yes, you know, we, acknowledging that we've got our own cultural institutions which are held within our communities <laughs> and we've for generations you know digital space is just another medium but it, it doesn't hold all of our knowledge it's, it's like you said joy it's with the, we are our, our our communities and our elders and those who have specific knowledge and practice around a specific you know um, whether it's an art form or a performance it's held and it's continued to be passed on irrespective of what's happening within these institutions so acknowledging that that our communities are already doing the doing and and sharing the knowledge in our way but cultural institutions that hold our our heritage uh uh, wanting to catch up because they need to be meaningful, <laughs> you know, and, and there's all these things around, hey, let's be, be up with what's happening and, and repatriate and let's, you know, like with what you're saying, Noel, the whole giving back of, of whether it's, you know, the bones of our ancestors that were taken for the study of, of whatever, but they want to return the physical, you know, um, bones, but what, everything in terms of the research has been carried out, all of that, like you're saying, Noel, the return of it, but the photograph is still there. So how can we, yeah. Anyway, I'm just rambling, but it's just got me thinking. But I think the key thing is, which is key to what we're doing is acknowledging that, um, you know, these are all digital platform is just another medium. It's, it's a vehicle, but I think that the knowledge is with our communities <laughs> and is maintained and preserved in our communities. 
and yeah i will leave it there um if we still have time i just i have maybe two things to say if do we have time noel is that okay okay um one i think um is really i think what um we talked a bit about in terms of it, it needs to be more repatriation and more transparency about the content and this is the this is the responsibilities not of just the indigenous people consistently well they didn't ask for it so we don't have to give it back or they didn't ask about the history and they didn't ask about the colonial pathway that has came to us and so we don't have to um and that's it's the museum's responsibility it is these institutions responsibility to stand it's like to say we have this data to provide all of that history to show the colonial legacy and bear their coloniality like th this is we can't you can't talk about the glory of repatriating ancestors and how great you are and you've achieved your grant deliverables if you're not talking about that colonial past there's there's no good without that past right you're just it's just performative um and i think that that's really important is moving forward and moving forward with the whole self um of the organization um, and recognizing that this uh, accountability is more than just a fancy statement you put on your social media posts. Um, the other thing that I would say is, um, so just in terms of thinking about my lived experience, I'm a foster kid. I grew up in the foster care system as a ward of two states, California and Oklahoma, from the age five until I aged out of the system. Um, I was a, a, it was under the umbrella of Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and so I just I think about when I think about where I sit and where I am now and I'm here because of amazing black indigenous communities like women of color who have supported me and believed in me right. Um, and how I've been able to connect with community was through these access points and sometimes through these digital access points and these virtual access points because foster system did not necessarily create a system because it's that it's the colonial system and I my experience is not unique um and I think that there and there are more generations that are getting moved through this colonial system of detachment from who we are and I think about what does it mean for what is it our responsibility what is it what does it look like to also recognize that for many of our communities that don't have our young people, I'm not even that young, but for people like me, right? If, uh, what if they didn't have that access point being able to grow? So how do we like, is that the on-ramp? But it also is like, what is it step from there? That can't be the only on-ramp to your indigeneity. And so I think it's just thinking about these different access points too, and how do we make sure that we are cultivating these spaces um, so that we're also not perpetuating lateral violence and and um, internally, um, it's not my fault I was a foster kid. Not that we are saying that, but I just think about that in terms of too. It's like these various cycles of colonialism that a lot of us may be trapped in, and and we're still like working through what that means too. Yeah, that is like uh, Hawaiians called it the Inoa Po. I mean the the um uh well for me that my name came from a dream name you know a pro but it's also this idea that there are other pathways right of knowledge and information that it can be through dreams it can be through ek and other ways where if there is if we don't have access to other kinds of information it doesn't mean that those pathways are closed like you're saying um so so powerful um i you know the, the the your your earlier point, Brandy, about this idea of institutional, um, the the institutions recognizing their colonial past. Um, I do think to circle back to regenerations, um, the exhibition. I think that they actually did, um, did do that, right? That it was um, an attempt on their part to like acknowledge the the context within which this body of work came came into being but then to to allow it um to sort of have this other ultimately more important life right that that his intention is superseded by the way in which it is activated and utilized and connected to by um by descendants today of these images but that does not mean like you kind of go to the glory of this moment and not come to terms and really wrestle with Bishop Museum's legacy and involvement in um, the study of eugenics as are, so it's fascinating. How did he get all these photographs? 
18, imagine a lot of them are kids, 18 principals said, yes, you can have access to our students. I, I imagine there weren't that many schools back then. I don't know. But I mean, 18 principals, that's a lot. So did they have parental consent? Probably not. You know what I mean? Not, not in the 20s. They weren't asking parents to consent. So that's a whole other issue. But I think it's really interesting that as we grapple with the positive ways in which um, the Sullivan Collection has been reactivated, that it still comes with all the baggage of its past that we have to unpack. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so... <laughs> So I hope we have enough energy for a few questions. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I do feel like really, you know, emotional. Uh, uh, covered a lot of ground and a lot of like really personal territories. So I want to thank you guys for that. Um, are there any questions out there? By anyone? Uh, I think Jillian was going to facilitate the Q&A or um, read out any questions that might have come up because I'm incapable of monitoring chat and <laughs> moderating <laughs> at the same time. Yes, if, if folks want to put questions into the chat, another alternative is go ahead and turn your camera on and I can recognize you that way if you'd like to actually just um, speak your question, have a conversation. That's great too. And I see um, John David Crawford. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, yes, ladies, um, thank you for what you're doing. Um, I was just wondering, what is what, what do you hope at the end of this is your legacy? Like, what, what, do, what do you want your legacy to be at the end of all of this, uh, if that makes sense? Hopefully it's positive. Do you mean legacy like? With what you've done with this program, what you're doing is is obviously it's amazing to me. I I'd never heard of it. I you know I'm I, I'm from Kansas, going to school, and I also am adopted. Well, I guess you weren't adopted, but I was through that program. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I was through that program. But um, I just wonder, you know, I we heard a lot of emotions, and you know, at the end, I I just wonder, what do you hope? you know, as, as it's the final end, <laughs> like, what do you, what do you hope that, 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 that you have succeeded at the end of everything? That may not have made sense. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> I can go if just maybe real short. I just want to do my ancestors proud on, I mean, real short. Like I just, I, I, I feel I want to make sure that I'm, that the oppressions in the museum field and in education that I've had to experience and continue to still experience even in a progressive space um, that hopefully I can make a space that the next generation doesn't have to and maybe they have a different battle and that the ancestors can go home because they were stolen from their resting places um, and the belongings so I, I just I feel like that that's why I consistently feel like I'm matrixing the hostile environments of academia and um, museums. And so. Thank you. I'm looking at Joy. Is Joy unmuting? <laughs> I knew you were looking at me. No, um, but I, I'll go, Joy. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll go. I'll go. Um, I would. I, I'd say same, same thing. I, I do this uh, for my ancestors. Um, and as, a, as an educator, if I can help, you know, one, you know, schools aren't really designed to support indigenous people to think about these things. So if I can be in, in the academy or in spaces where uh, indigenous, like there's like five people in this exhibit that I personally know that are in those photographs that are in the actual exhibit. And um, three of them are in work in libraries. Um, and, you know, like if, and one of, and two of them are my students. So the, um, as they, as folks go out into, into museums and into these spaces, if they're armed with this knowledge around ethics, 
around how we around protocols around how to intervene then you know that's a pretty good legacy like i don't need like i don't need to be remembered for that but if that if that idea of how do we keep pushing this continues then maybe i've contributed a little something right um, and that's that's all I can hope for is did I help move forward what my ancestors needed for us to continue? <laughs> yes, to uh, Brandy, Susan, also Joy. Thank you, Don David. I think with and I, I and my um, hostel talking about Nave, you know, we both feel the same way with the work we're doing. Really is. You know, we we acknowledge and value that we are part of living communities that are continuing to preserve our ways of knowing, seeing, and doing, but also acknowledging the challenges of living as diaspora and raising kids. You know, um, first, second, third generations. How can we ensure that we embed them so they can stand with the knowledge to stand strong in who they are, but at the same time conscious that these cultural institutions and and these spaces are actually still defining who we are, you know, and how do you counter that? You counter that by ensuring that our knowledge is within those spaces as well, you know, so whoever is wanting to research or know about, you know, collections, yeah, they know that, yes, it was collected by William Oldman, <laughs> the name is, you know, but actually it's from this village in Tonga and it was made by at this time, you know, so it's addressing the balance of the domination of the others viewing and and dictating our knowledge through what's what's held in these institutions um by by balancing that knowledge i think that's that sort of you know we don't want our children and our grandchildren to be having the same conversations that's basically that's what it is i think we would have made a step towards leaving a better legacy when they can talk about something else you know and i think for us it's the key really is embedding um and filling those knowledge gaps that is huge here in Aotearoa. If I can just jump in here too, uh, I'm really hoping that we get to think about how, how these mea have life and agency of their own, right? And I can only say that because I've literally seen it. I've seen that if we kahea, if we call out long enough, loud enough, they respond. So the coup images that came um, together in 2010, the amount of obstacles that were removed in order that in order to do this international and national kind of temporary exhibition, it, it was, it never could have happened in like a matter of years, even looking at colonial pool. Um, and the return of the cloak, which was first temporary and now it's permanent by Te Papa, like that is unheard of. So this idea that 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 there's a really an ongoing relationship that is not just about do we have access and what what is our contemporary conversations, but the reality that that they exist with their own sense of agency and life and that they're reaching forward just as we're reaching back you know I don't know like I, I'd like to think that you know in the in 1920 maybe some of these ancestors you know thought that their image might be held by those generations into the future right and so how do we um I don't know just breathe life these are not mausoleums Museums are not mausoleums, nor are they dead ends, meaning uh, life can continue on. Like they don't have to stay in the museum, right? Um, there, the, there are future pathways yet to be un, uh, yet to be revealed, right? So um, yeah, anyway, great question. Thank you, John. There is a sort of a related question in the chat, which is thinking about the next generation. How do you keep the younger generation interested to continue the kind of work that you're doing um, with so many generational differences? How, how do you foresee the future? Uh, 
And I feel like I, I went first last time, but I, I can, if you want <laughs> go first again, <laughs> just, I, I can name it. I can talk about a program that I did in Pine Ridge. Um, and it's, I mean, so get it, the young people did not want to talk to the museum, had no interest in me as an educator at the museum. Um, and so we really asked young people, what did they, what do they want? What are they interested? Um, and they talked about music. They talked about spoken word, all of these things. Spoken word is oral tradition just in a different new manifestation of it. And so what does it look like to create these spaces and call on ancestral knowledge and call on oral tradition, call on your um, tribal values? Uh, and what does it look like to build it in that space? And so that's what we did. Um, and I think that, that what that platform did is hearing their wants, also recognizing the community and their cultural practices and what did they do? They started digging into policies. They started because they wanted to create poems and they wanted to talk about their community and they're talking about they're connecting with elders and they're bringing in Lakota language and they were bringing in songs and different moves. And I think that it was really powerful that we didn't have to tell them to do it like that was that was part of who they are is the platform that they wanted to express it was through or like through spoken word through poetry their literacy scores went up as well because they started engaging and what does that look like to be able to write it to speak it um so i i see it when i think about what does it look like to also not be a square <laughs> like we i think sometimes we get so stuck in that it has to be this way but we can we continue to grow and we are still indigenous peoples, even if we continue to absorb and think about ways of knowing and being and, and so I think about that program um, is for me is still a really powerful program it's still going on. And it has like consistently young people are continuing to engage in their ways. <laughs> okay i'll go this time boy I think. We've kind of already touched on it, and you know, maybe just reflect on 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 the project that I talked around the arts of Moana Oceania, and trying to really um, kind of break the current thinking where they love to just lump us all as one <laughs> community with one way of knowing and doing, and knowing that we need to also acknowledge the diversity. Yes, we are. We have similarities, but also our uniqueness is in our diversity, and we can be united in our diversity. So um, wanting to kind of break from the status quo of wanting to talk about, about us as one and generalize us as one, and, and, address, and, and also being conscious that we've got a lot of our younger generations who are of multiple ethnicities, you know, here. Not, they're not Tongan, they could be Tongan, Samoan, Maori. What does that mean? And a lot of them, you know, um, I have not come across, you know, maybe, yeah, I have not come across any, you know, a lot of young people who stand in those three, you know, for them, it's like, oh, I'm mixed. I don't, you know, don't know. I'm, I'm a Kiwi out here or New Zealand born, but actually, OMG, you've got three lineages. And what does that mean? So really the, the, the thing for us is knowledge. If we don't arm our young people with the knowledge <laughs> to know where they come from. And if you are, you know, of three cultures, with your makeup that's like three bodies of knowledge you know so you are you know enriched and for the better and and I think it kind of addresses a lot of the problems that we are having here in Aotearoa I can only speak to it as you know a lot of our young people you know having identity sort of issues but also suicide is huge you know and and when you kind of go back to how we've done things and our way of knowing seeing and doing you know these yeah, there's there's richness in there that can counter all of that. But if if our our young kids do not know that, if they don't have those baskets of knowledge, then how can they navigate? You know, then they can navigate more confidently and take what they think is relevant, but also discard those things that will just um, drown them. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I guess I'll talk about a project too. One of the really cool projects that I've been working on is uh, out the. I created a website for this group called Young Sawara, uh, that is a group of of young people that uh, are in all parts of the South Pacific and throughout the Pacific, but like 
primarily in Fiji and the Cook Islands and Aotearoa, and they've and they do all this amazing like organizing. They do all these different things around deep sea mining, or they're looking at West Papua, or like they're, they're doing all these things. But their stuff is everywhere. It's on Instagram, it's on Facebook, right? And so they asked me to create a website for them, which basically beca becomes this archive for them uh, in this digital way, you know, as a, all the stuff that I just talked about digital platforms. Um, but I, it's become this digital archive for them to see all the work that they've done in the past, since like 2015 when they were created. And they were so like, wow, like, you know, like we are these artists and there's and they're particular uh, focus on spoken word and, and art making and they have art camps, um, you know, every couple of years. And they were able to be able to see all of their hard work and their organizing and, their, and, the, and the issues that they're passionate about in this one space that's for them, about them, and also to get that knowledge out around their political issues that are going, and it, and it helps because people in Hawaii don't necessarily think about people in Melanesia, right? People in Hawaii are not necessarily thinking about the South Pacific. So through this platform, we can get, we can create this connection among youth around how do you think about archiving your organizing? How do you think about archiving the things that you're passionate about? And it really got them excited. So that means that they're doing more things and they're documenting more things and getting more things to the website so that they can, right? And then another really cool project that I did in the Marshalls was to bring like, you know, a 16 cameras to youth. I don't remember, it might've been more than that because somebody else kept telling their story about climate change and about their islands. So I gave them cameras and say, tell me your story of your islands because you need to, arch like for you to be able to archive what the marshals looks like, feels like, and means for you in this moment. Not this, not, oh, we're drowning, oh, we're disappearing, oh, we're this, oh, we're that. And the photographs shifted entirely from what you see in the New York Times or in, right, and there all the science journals about how they think about, right? These are folks who are in their, you know, 16, early 20s, right? Like get it, creating their own archive, their own image for the future, you know, so that's really exciting stuff, right? Um, and, and they act, they have the physical, the photograph and the digital photograph, right? But they also have that memory of like this empowering moment of like I get to choose what I what I let you see, right? So yeah, you know, one of the things that this COVID moment, which is not a moment, it's now a year going, you know, beyond a year. Right? Who knows how long this, this COVID moment is going to last. Um, and, and what that's meant is when we have students that are, are not in the classroom, that are sitting at home, um, you know, the, and the need for teachers to access information, content, which is really now in digital form, right? Then it's, there's this kind of like corresponding push to, to uh, provide access to digital content for students now. And so, you know, one of the things is, um, I was talking about this Hui Panala'au project. One of the outcomes is like trying to get this, share this content, share this information, not just with schools and teachers, but with communities as well. And again, so how do we think about, um, all these protocols in place, how do we approach this when the corresponding push is really the need and interest of our students? So because this project involved teenagers, Native Hawaiian teenagers, there's so much interest around it. And I'll never forget being at the auditorium at Kamehameha Schools and having the entire fifth grade sing and dance a hula to a song that my grandfather helped write, you know, called Under a Jarvis Moon. Um, and so, you know, we know, we know even, uh, you know, so many ways in which our, um, 
our students, our young people are interested, whether it's the arts, whether it's the history, you know, all the different ways in which they can connect. Um, and, you know, that's almost the, the, the beauty and the danger of the digital realm that we exist in right now. And so I know we only scratched the surface, um, but, but I am so grateful for this time that we've had together um, to, to dive deep um, and close to ourselves and to each other um, and to, yeah, weave this story that of, of complexity. Like these are not simple issues and they shouldn't be because we're not simple people as, um, you know, as Joy said. Uh, so I'm just, you know, and I said this before, like, it's a webinar, but I actually was super excited just to be able to share space with these amazing, um, amazing women. And the word, the words um, role model come to mind. How each of you um, are such amazing role models for the community, for the fields that, that you all are in. Um, and I can only imagine moving forward, how much more um, work and inspiration you all will um, accomplish for your communities. So that's my mihi. <laughs> that's my um, mahalo to, to Kolakesa, to Brandy, and to Joy, um, and, and to Bishop Museum for, for creating this space for us to temporarily Occupy so that we can explore issues we're interested in. <laughs> Thank you, Mahalo. Um, this has been incredible. I I know Noel says it was just scratching the surface, but I it's been such a privilege to be here in, I guess, fittingly this digital room with all of you and and to hear your experiences and insights. And I I know that there's just so much for us to think about as a museum um, with the collection of photography from regenerations and, and beyond into our institutional practices and digitization. And I'm so grateful to, to have shared this time with you all. Thank you, everyone. And thanks everyone in our audience for joining us. Um, yeah, I think, I think we can wrap it up here. Um, hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you. Yeah, aloha everyone. Thank you so much. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo.